Amen. Go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> All right, Romans 7 today. Romans 7. Kind of coming up to that halfway point in our study through the book of Romans, which is not a small task. Not a small task. I hope you are well today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and if you guys would like, go to fresnochurch.info and just click on sermon notes. You can follow along with uh, my transcript today that I'm mostly going to try to try to read from um, because there's a lot here. And so if I start picking my head up too much, we're going to be here too long. So, And then the, the verses will be on the screens as well. So the past few weeks, we've been discussing what our relationship with sin is now that we have been resurrected to new life in Christ. Today in Romans chapter 7, we are going to look at our relationship with the law in the context of our new life in Christ. How do we relate to God's law and the old covenant? So Romans 7. You better strap in. Because Romans 7 is a ride. If you have your Bibles, pick them up. Follow along. Follow along, Romans 7, coming off of chapter 6, and uh, welcome to everyone on the live stream. Um, so sorry about last week. Uh, the live stream would have been awesome if there was sound, so I apologize. We are, we are working, and the team is doing an awesome job, um, so I apologize that that message is now lost to the memories of those who were here, but you can... Well, you can't anymore. You could have gone and read the transcript, but now it is truly lost. Um, but go back and read Romans 6, and, uh, and we're, we're thankful you're joining us online. Okay, no more to say. Let's go. Since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. So then, if she is married to another man while her husband is, is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. Then, if she is married to another man, she is not an adulteress. The application now, verse 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. But now... We have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. Now, verse 6 is where we're going to park it today, but like our tradition has become, we're going to read through the whole chapter, and I think there's going to be benefit in that going forward because the more we read Romans 7, the more e easily it's going to be to understand this, all right? So hang in there. Here we go. Verse 7. What should we say then? Another question Paul's going to ask. Is the law sin? Absolutely not. But I would, have, I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. Thou shalt not covet. Gary, bringing the King James up in here. And sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life again, and I died. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. And through it, through the commandment, sin killed me. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, just, and good. Therefore, did what is good become death to me? Absolutely not. Again, but in order, but sin, in order to be recognized as sin, was producing death in me through what is good. 
through what is good, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. And I mean, this is a lot to talk through, and I'm sure questions are coming to our mind. We're going to get to it. We're going to soak in Romans 7 today and for the next few weeks, because this is a lot to work through. For we know, verse 14, that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh. I'm sold as a slave under sin. For I do not understand what I am doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, CSB, help us out here. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but sin I am totally lost. But sin living in me. Verse 18. For I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me. But there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do. But I practice the evil that I don't want to do. Now if I do what I do not want. I am no longer the one that does it. But it is sin the sin that lives in me. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, what do I find present with me? Evil. Evil is present with me. For in my inner self, Paul's talking about a lot of different things here. He says I, then he says in my flesh, and now he says my inner self. In my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. And what does Paul conclude? What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And if we left it there, it would be a very sad story. But verse 25 Thanks be to God through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I myself am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, the law of sin. And man, I'm excited to get into all of that, but we're just going to start with the beginning today, talking about verses 1 through 6, what is our relationship with the law? And then in the weeks ahead, we're going to unpack, again, like I said last week, for the next few weeks, we're going to be soaking in this kind of trio of our new life in Christ, and now how we relate to the law, how we relate to sin. Now that we've been literally made alive, we were dead, how is our relationship to these things different? In chapter 6, we already talked about how before Christ, before we were in Christ, we were slaves of sin. And Paul references that again here. But now we're going to move today into, okay, well then how do we relate to the law now? Because we've seen in Romans that our relationship to the law before Christ was condemnation. We were condemned by the law. That was our relationship. So what has changed? That's what we're going to look at today. Would you pray with me? Would you pray for yourselves? Would you thank the Lord for his word for each other today? Father, God, I thank you. We're, we're, we are but dust. And yet we have Christ. And he is enough. So, so may we feel that by your mercy today. May we feel the sufficiency of Christ. Lord, please. Lord, I, I'm not even actually going to ask. I've already asked, Lord. So I'm going to thank you. I'm going to thank you that you're going to speak to us today, Lord, because you're good and you're faithful. I don't need to ask you a million times, God. You have heard and you do hear, hear us today. And so we just give thanks. With gratitude, we acknowledge you. With gratitude, you've brought us to this place with these people. We've been made alive in Christ. We're children of God so much more than we deserve. We don't deserve any of this. But yet, you are good to bring us to this place. And you're good to now speak to us. Oh, Lord, we, we wait with that, that m amazement at your mercy that you would speak to us today. And that we can actually thank you beforehand because we're that confident in our God and in the goodness of our God. What a perspective change. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Man, I told Jeremy this morning, here I am getting away from my notes. 
I told Jeremy this morning, uh, the Lord's been doing a work on me this week, and um, my mom has sent me these, these, uh, these kind of broadcast messages by Mark DeJesus, which, which I've, I've referenced before, but he just, he really helps talk through a lot of mental health things and stuff, which um, I, I struggle with, and so it's really been a help this week um, to come away from the idea of asking God for help all the time. God, come down here. God, help me. God, do something. God, help. God, help. Help, help, help. To just thanking God that he's already heard the million cries for help I've given. And just going forward in thanksgiving now. And so it's just, it's just a powerful lesson. It's hard to do because my instinct is like, no, 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 I got to ask for help. No, no, no I got to ask God to do this. I got to ask him to do that. There's a place for that. But there's a place to just stop and thank God for what he's done, what he's, go- and he's here. He's already heard. He's going to work. That's, that's, that's fearful. That's kind of weird. That's kind of scary, but that's our faith. Okay, verse one. Before we get, isn't it a beautiful day? Praise God. Praise God. Oh, the clouds, the cool fall air is here. I love it. All right, verse one. You ready? Are we ready? Come on, church. Come on, friends. We're ready. Since I am speaking to those who know the law, Paul says, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? Paul seems to indicate that he is specifically addressing Jews here, but the application is by no means limited to the Jews. Why do I say that? Because who was under the law? Who was of the law? Who knew the law? The Jews, not the Gentile world. And by way of reminder or clarification, because we are talking about the law again, the Jews were of the law or under the law. What does that mean and why were the Gentiles not those things? What was the difference here? What does that mean? Oh, or it means that Jews believed in the Mosaic law, the covenant made, that God made with Moses in Israel, Mount Sinai. And they believed it was from the Lord. And they believed it was the moral authority for their lives. That was their relationship with the law. They were of and under this law of God. Now, except for some Gentile converts, the Gentiles neither believed nor held to any of that. We've established many times now that most of us in here are ethnic Gentiles. But before we came to Christ, a lot of us knew and held to the law of God still. Specifically, and most likely, the Ten Commandments. Many of us knew the Ten Commandments before we came to Christ or had some reference and knew that they were good and we, you know, you know gave lip service to, yeah, that's, that's good stuff to obey. You know, honoring your parents, not murdering, you know, stuff like that. That's good stuff. Most of us knew that. And if that was the case, then we were also of or under the law like the Jews because that was our relationship. We, we held to it. We held to the Ten Commandments. But we've also established that reality that we were under the law, did not bring us any closer to God than those without the law, those who didn't care about the Ten Commandments or any of the laws. It actually brought us into stricter judgment because now we are specifically condemned by our sin, whereas the rest of the Gentiles are just altogether lost in their sins. Just because the Gentiles, those without the law, didn't know or didn't believe in God's law doesn't make them somehow innocent. It makes them blind and that much more lost. If those under the law are somehow more guilty because they have the law, then those without the law are somehow more lost. Neither are in good shape. This is Romans 1 through 3 again. Remember? The Gentile world is under the wrath of God, and then the Jews are no better because they judge everyone else, but they're doing the same things. Remember that from chapter 2? So today we are going to turn from looking at our relationship with sin to now looking at our relationship with the law. And this is huge. This is huge, guys. Many of us can say we are free from the law, but how free are you? How free are you from the law? What does that even mean? I fear many of us don't have good answers to these questions. And so the result is living our lives in this quasi in between of, well, I'm not under those specific laws, but I'm still under these laws, I think, right? kind of becomes how we function as Christians because we don't understand what Paul's going to say today and hopefully by the end of today we will or at least a little more. 
Paul says in this verse, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as they're alive? Implying that the jurisdiction of the law ends with our life. Still with me? This is going to be dense, but it's good. It's rich. Remember Jeremy's illustration from two weeks ago? When he was, you can go back and listen to this message. It was a great illustration. And he was talking about how sin is no longer our master. I want to apply that, illustra- apply that illustration here. He, Jeremy used this illustration of him robbing Walmart. And when he does that, police show up, they arrest him, they put Jeremy in the squad car, they take Jeremy to the station, and, and in this illustration, Jeremy says, okay, if in, that, in this illustration, I die on the way to the station, does the police officer then take Jeremy's body and book it into a cell so he can await a hearing? No, no, that's absurd. It's all over. It's all over. It doesn't matter. He's dead. I mean, even if what he did had the death penalty, we, I mean, we didn't, even, we didn't even have the chance to get through. He's already dead. It's already the harshest judgment. The law has lost control over Jeremy's life because there's no life. There's no life there. The law has no jurisdiction over me when I'm dead. Isn't that amazing? So if there's joy to be had, uh, I mean, sadly, I'm also dead. So if I'm free from the law, I don't really get to enjoy that freedom because I'm dead. This is complicated stuff. The law has no more hold on me. So verse 2. For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies... She is released from the law regarding the husband. So the last few weeks in chapter 6, we've seen Paul using the analogy of slavery to demonstrate our freedom from the hold and power of our old master who was sin. Sin was our old master. We were slaves, but no longer because Jesus set us free and now we're slaves to righteousness. Right. Now Paul moves into a different analogy to demonstrate our freedom from the law. And this analogy he uses is that of marriage. Now we are not meant to go too deeply into this analogy. And if we do, it, it, it'll start breaking down. So don't try to take this analogy farther than Paul means it. Uh, the analogy is not really apples for apples with the application necessarily. But we are going to go back to it and, and look how it applies. Let's find the point of this analogy. In this, Paul is not considering divorce in the equation or other variables. The setup is simply, marriage is a lawful institution, and in marriage, husband and wife are bound to each other by the Mosaic law, by God's law for his people. That is the case. That's how it works. Now, when the husband dies in this equation, the wife is no longer bound to him. She's not supposed to stay unmarried until she dies too. She's not like, well, I'm married to this body. No, you're not. He's dead. He's dead. In that sense, you are free from the law that bound you to your husband. Do you you see this? Death has freed her from the law's jurisdiction, the law's grasp. It no longer has a hold over her in this situation. So verse 3, don't be deceived. Looks like we're moving fast. We are going to slow down in verse 4. Don't worry. So then, if she is married to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. Then if she is married to another man, she is not an adulteress. Maybe it sounds redundant, but follow along here. If she decides to marry another man while her husband is alive, she is in clear violation because she's married to two men. Do you see this here? Stay with the analogy. Don't go outside of it. Well, what if she's divorced? And, 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 and No, 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 no. That, that, that's not what we're, t- we're, no, she's married. So if she's married to two men, she's in clear violation of the law at that point, which means she's not faithful to the first husband. The law has been broken in this case. Her husband must die before the law will allow her to remarry. Did you hear that? Hear that. The husband must die before she's allowed to remarry. Now we're going to get into the application. The husband must die before she can be remarried. Death is what brings freedom from the law. That's the point of this analogy. Death 
is what brings freedom from the law. So if that's the case, verse 4. Here's the application of the analogy. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ. Remember, we died with Christ. We were put to death through the body of Christ. Why? So that we may belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So in the past few weeks, again, looking back at our context, we've seen that we have died to sin and its power over us. Hopefully we've established that. And that's not something we'll somehow never forget. We're going to have to come back to that again and again and again. When you're tempted, when you're feeling like you're drowning in sin, you've got to remember that truth. You've got to go back to Romans 6. No, I have died to sin. It doesn't have a hold on me. It is no longer our master. But here in chapter 7, Paul is showing us that we, when we died with Christ, we also died to the law's jurisdiction. This, this is, not, this is not as easy to get for a lot of us because we are so used to thinking in terms of the law. We're so used to thinking in terms of our performance and our obedience and what we have to do. It's ingrained in us. It's so natural. So, so this is going to be a little harder to get. When you died with Christ, you also died to the law's jurisdiction over you. Now, think about the implications of that. That's what we're going to get into. It, it no longer has a hold of us. So if we want to try to return to the marriage analogy, the husband is our old man. And this is another thing we're going to find in Romans. We've got to figure out, we've got to define who I is and who you is when Paul's using it. Because he says, you died with Christ. Now we know physically we didn't die with Christ. That was 2,000 years ago. Our physical bodies were not somehow with, you see what I'm saying? So when Paul says you, he's not talking about your physical form. He's not talking about everything that encompasses you. He must be talking about the old man. Remember Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Spiritually, spiritually, we were with Christ on the cross, with Christ in the grave, and with Christ when he rose to newness of life. That's the spiritual reality and glory of the gospel. That is our new life. So notice the words when Paul's saying I and you and mark them and say, okay, who, let's define who is I here. And we're going to do that a little bit more in the coming weeks. But again, trying to give some look back on the context and look ahead a little bit today. So we're, we're not just having this, you know, zero focus in on this. The old man is dying with Christ. And we, in a sense, are who we are, maybe our soul, is the wife freely being married to another. And who is that? Jesus! In this analogy, the husband must die so that we can be married to another who is Christ. You have been married to another. That's the title today, married to another. And we're going to talk about, okay, that's the spiritual, at least that's the, the, the analogical reality based on this, this marriage illustration Paul's using. Now, if we are dead in relation to the law, let's think about the ramifications of this, okay? Okay. At first, what I'm saying might feel and sound scary and wrong, but stick with me and hold me to the Word of God. If this is what Paul's saying, it is the Word of God, and we have nothing to fear and everything to gain. Notice this statement. Notice how it hits you and where your mind and your feelings go when I say this. If we are free from the law, we are free from all of the law. If we are free from the law, we are free from all of it. Now, again, I'm, I'm not talking about the laws of our country and state. No, you're, you're, you're not, we're not free from the law that says, you know, go 65 and you go 85. You're going to get fined. We're talking about God's law, the moral authority, the moral law that God gave us for our lives. If we are free from the law, we are free from all of it. 
Sit in that. We are not judged or held by the standard of even the Ten Commandments any longer. Whoa. Heresy! (laughs) After what we've read in Romans the past few weeks, how could we come to any other conclusion? The law was good, but it was insufficient. We have Christ. We have Jesus now. He is better than the law. He is better than the law. Now, maybe we should have come to this conclusion a few weeks ago because the questions that are coming to our mind right now are the questions that Paul has already addressed. Remember his question in the beginning of Romans 6? Well, well, if we're under grace and not the law, should, should we just sin? What was his answer? Absolutely not. By no means. God forbid. Whatever version you're using. And then the second question we addressed last week, if we're not under the law, you know, if we're, if we're not under the law anymore, well, well, should we sin because we're free to technically, right? Paul's answer, absolutely not. Well, if we are bound to the Ten Commandments, should we go murder? Should we covet? Should we dishonor our parents? Oh man, great question. I don't know. What does Paul say? Absolutely not. But Why? But why does Paul say absolutely not? Wouldn't the logical reasoning lead us to that conclusion that we're, if we're free, we're free to do that stuff? Why? Absolutely not. All this stuff, all coveting, murder, dishonoring our parents, all of that, just because we're free from the law doesn't make it not sin now. Just because we are not held to the standard of law does not mean that these sinful things are somehow pleasing to the one who saved us. And if these actions are still sin, why, after being set free from sin, would we go back to it? That was our conclusion. That was our discussion last week. We don't obey the Ten Commandments out of fear of being judged by them or for the sake of obeying the law. That's what it means to not be under the law any longer. We've died to it. But I'm still going to avoid murder and coveting. I'm still going to seek to honor my parents and avoid idolatry and not bear false witness and not steal and all of that stuff. But why? How is that any different than being under the law if our goal is still the same? Do you see this? If the goal is still the same, how is it any different than just being under the law where we were in the first place? Is it all semantics? Has anything actually changed? Yes, you, you've changed. You have been changed. You were dead and now you're alive. This isn't just semantics. The whole game has changed. You have life now. You're indwelled by God himself. You've been made new. Under the law, you were helpless and dead. Your goal, maybe you were thinking, oh, yeah, I shouldn't murder. Or, and, and then Jesus comes along and says, hey, have you ever been angry with someone wrongly? Murder. We're done. Under the law, we're flattened. We have nothing. All our attempts to obey the law simply brought more death because that's all the factory of our life could crank out. Our best efforts could be chalked away as self-righteousness and pride because our lives were all about us. Everything good I thought I was doing was still about me and it was motivated from me and from the flesh, which was a prisoner of sin. How could I do anything good in God's eyes? Maybe you were praised by people. Maybe they lifted you up. But before God, your life couldn't please Him. Because it was all flesh. It was all sin. That's hard to reckon with. But we have to come to that conclusion in order to discover the new life, the goodness of God, and the righteousness of Christ that He gives us, His righteousness. We did not have the only good one, Christ. So yes, things have changed. We are alive in Christ. And I know we can break down the 613 laws of the Old Covenant into different groups. We've done this. I've heard this. And, and, and that's healthy. Oh, well, you have the, the moral law. You have the, um, 
I don't know what it is, the different kinds of laws that all those old covenant laws, you, you, have, you have this variety. You have the Ten Commandments, which seem to apply to all people at all times. But then you have commandments that are repeated like three times. Don't boil a goat in its mother's milk. Like, all right, I'm nailing that commandment. 612 more to go. So, so we can break them down and say, well, this doesn't really apply to us anymore. That was for that context. And, you know, these dietary restrictions and cleanliness laws, those aren't really for us. But these 10, they're still for us. But if we do that, if we break down these laws into these groups and figure out which apply to us or not, what are we doing in that scenario? We're still under the law. We're still under the law. Now as free children of God in Christ, when we assess which laws apply to us and which don't, here's the difference. We're no longer assessing for the sake of those laws and for the sake of our good performance, but for the sake of discerning God's will and desire for us. That's why we can look at the 10 and say, yeah, that's, probably shouldn't murder. Probably shouldn't steal. Because that's an accurate revelation of God's will and desire for our daily lives. It, it, it reveals something about his character, his nature. Because in this, we don't just throw the law away now as if it's worthless to us. All of Psalm 119 is David in love and, and, and pouring out praise to God for the law. And how was David made righteous? Because David kept the law? How were we made righteous? Someone besides Gary. <laughs> faith, faith in Christ. How was David saved? King David, Abraham, faith. But here, David is saying, oh, God, I love your law. I love your ordinances. So it's not that we just throw the law away as if it's worthless now. But we do have something better. We do have something. Here I am getting away from the notes. So am I saying that Ten Commandments don't apply to us anymore? Well, yes and no. So no, let's deal with the no first. They do not apply to us as a law that we are under or a standard we are held to. You have to get this. The Ten Commandments are no longer the standard by which you will be judged. Even as I say that, I'm like, and I'm like, no, no. That's not the standard anymore. Beloved, that's not the standard anymore. Are you, are, are, you know, are you loving the Lord with all your, your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And are you doing that? Could any of us do that in the flesh? No. These are not the laws by which you are judged. These are not the laws by which you are judged. So, so no, they don't apply to us in that sense. If this doesn't take hold, then what we are talking about will just be semantics. And you were, your understanding will be contradicting. You, you will live as a Christian who is, who is semi-free from the law. Who, who in fear is still like, no, no, I have to, I have to do this still. I have to obey this still. I have to, I have to regard this still as, as a standard. But, but I'm free. What? Does that make any sense? Oh, it makes a ton of sense to us because that's how many of us have been living all our lives since we came to Christ. That's how I live. Now, yes, the Ten Commandments do apply to us. The Ten Commandments and other commandments like love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbors yourself and those commandments, they apply to us in the sense that those laws give us accurate understanding of God's will for us in our daily lives. We get to see the law and we get to discern the character and nature of God, His will for us. Like Paul encourages us, learn what's pleasing to the Lord. Learn what glorifies the Lord. The law is helpful in that. Here's the difference though. It's the difference of before we were crushed under the weight of the law. We were smothered underneath like a giant slab of, I don't know, diamond or some crazy 
mineral metal that just, there's no hope. We're just smashed by it. Now, versus standing with gratitude and confidence upon it. We're now standing on the law because we are now in the victorious Savior who fulfilled it. Get this, beloved. Jesus did not die for you and give you his righteousness so that you could then try to fulfill the law. Jesus is like, I won the race. Now you go back and do it. What? No. His victory is your victory. This is weird. This is mind-bending stuff. I'm, this is what it means to be in Christ. You're in Christ. You are victorious because you're in Christ. You're not standing upon the law in your righteousness and in, in independence. You're standing on the law in Christ because he has won the victory. He perfectly fulfilled the law. We still love God's law and we still heed it. And again, when you hear heed, under the law right away. No, no, no. We've already talked about the difference what it means to heed the law now. But our reasoning, perspective, and motivation have, have been totally changed. That's why Paul and other New Testament writers, they use the Old Testament law to encourage our obedience. Why would they do that if we're not under the law? Oh, are you with me right now? Hang on. Because they help us understand what pleases God. Take Ephesians 6, for example. We're going to go to Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, oh no, which is the first commandment with promise, so that it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Paul just told us that we've died in relation to the law, Romans 7, 4. And now in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, Paul says, hey, remember the, I think it's the fourth commandment, honor your father and your mother. But what does Paul say? This is contradicting, is it not? No, it's not. Because that, Paul's not using it in that sense. He's not bringing the law in again and saying, hey, are you doing, are, you better be doing this. No, he's saying, hey, remember the fourth commandment? That's still God, that's still pleasing to God. Children obeying their parents is still pleasing to God. And now because you've made new, been made new, because you're alive in Christ, Children, you can actually obey your parents. That's good news. I remember as a, as a kid, there was a time in my life where I realized, okay, I want to obey my parents now. That's right. God told me to do it. I need to do that. And you know what I realized after that? I realized how easy it was to obey my parents. Not. I realized I couldn't. I couldn't stop talking back. I couldn't stop, you know, fighting to do what I want instead of obey. I couldn't, and it frustrated me. I have a vivid memory of going into my room and screaming into my pillow, saying, God, help me, or something like that, because I couldn't do it. But when I got saved, and maybe this sounds real clean and ideal, and, and I'm summarizing large, like, large portion of my life, not just, you know, one day. There's this night and day change. No, but being new in Christ, I had the power to obey my parents. And then I became the good child in our family. <laughs> <laughs> my siblings will testify. I get made fun of all, like, yes, it's awesome. No, but God, Paul's saying, this is still pleasing to the Lord. This, this is still the will of God. But it's not, not because it's the law. Oh, you better do the law. You better do the law. No, he said, hey, remember when God said that to the children of Israel, to us? Yeah, that's, that's still good. That's still good. So that is how the Ten Commandments apply. Does this make any sense? If it doesn't, that's okay. That's okay. Don't feel like you see everybody's heads nodding, which I praise God for, and you're like, oh, no, I'm left behind. Oh, no, I'm... No, no, we'll, we'll get to that. We're going to soak in this. It's God. God is going to give us understanding in this. And so if you're not really getting this right, that's okay. Hang in there. Hang in there. Okay. Oh, I got away from my notes. Guys, sorry. I, now I got to find where I am. 
<laughs> so I'm like, what did I cover? What did I not cover? All right. Children obeying their parents is not just a commandment to obey. It is right that children should obey their parents. It pleases the Lord and is appropriate with his design for humanity. We go, we go beyond the law. Exactly. We, exactly. It's a, it's, a, it's a revelation of who God is and, 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 and who we are to be. But we go past that to God himself because we have Christ. We have God himself. How silly would it be to go back to the law when God has given us himself? According to, um, okay, so now that we are new and alive and free, when we obey the law, our motive is not the law or fear of its judgment. We are just obeying Christ. And if Christ is our aim, the law, get this, is too low of a standard for us to settle for. Remember Jesus' devastating words in the Sermon on the Mount? If anyone's comforted by the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you know, know, when they first read it, when they're in the flesh, they're not reading it right. Because it is meant to destroy our efforts and our self-righteousness. Jesus, according to Christ, if you simply look at someone with lust, now you're guilty of adultery. What did the commandments say? The commandments didn't say nothing like that. They just said, don't commit adultery. And Jesus says, well, if you look at someone with lust, you've, you've committed adultery. Well, everybody should freak out. If, you mere, if you're merely unjustly angry with someone, as we talked about early, now you're guilty of murder according to Jesus' words. Jesus raised the bar that only his life could fulfill. He raised it so high that only he could do it. Our only hope is to die with Christ because there's no way we are meeting that standard. Even if somehow, like the Pharisees and the rich young ruler, remember, we deceive ourselves into thinking that we could somehow fulfill the base standard of the original law, Jesus' words now call us out of that deception into our true state of helplessness. And that's Romans 1 through 3 again. But we did die with Christ. And we were raised to new life in him. So that means we fulfilled the law in him because he did. This is why we must be in Christ. And this is what happens at salvation. We are placed in Christ. His death is our death to sin. And the law is death to sin and the law. And his life is our life. Remember Paul's words in Colossians 3. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And I have a note here that tells me to catch my breath. If you're reading along, just ignore that. Let's go back to verse 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, we've already talked about this, you also were put to death in relation to law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. We don't belong to the law anymore. We belong to another, Christ. Look at what Paul says in Galatians. And Galatians, man, it parallels what we've been talking about in Romans in like a condensed version. It, it parallels so well. Galatians 3, 22 through 26. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power. Well, that does not sound nice. So that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. There's like a verse that is so similar to that in Romans that we've already read. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. A brother and a father is better than a guardian or a schoolmaster, as some translations render that. And yet I, and probably many of you, we live as if we're still under the guardian or the schoolmaster, trying to reform and be good enough. Stop, because verse 4 says, you belong to him who raised, who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. We belong to Jesus, who was resurrected from the dead, so that we can bear fruit for God now. We don't bear fruit for God by trying to perform, trying to fulfill the law, trying to be good enough for something. We don't bear fruit for God by being awesome. Which sucks because I really like to be awesome. I really want to be awesome. I love it when I feel awesome. 
I love it when people praise me and make me feel like I'm a great Christian or whatever else, whatever other title I'm awesome at. But I'm not. None of us are awesome in here. I don't care what flattery has been ascribed to you. None of us are awesome. None of us are awesome. That's not how we bear fruit, which is good news. For when we were in the flesh, verse 5, oh, we're in verse 5 now. We're moving on. We're getting through this. The sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for what? Death. Oh, man, I love it. You guys are with me. Again, we are looking back on what was. And notice this phrase because this is going to occupy a lot of our discussions as we move into the rest of chapter 7 and chapter 8. This is another looking ahead moment. We looked back. We were dead. The fruit we bore was death. And now Paul says, when we were, what are those three next words? When we were in the flesh. That's going to be very important moving forward. Hold on to that. So Paul says, when we were in the flesh, that is a description of our state apart from Christ in the flesh. Who, who are we in now? Christ. We're in Christ. So moving forward, Paul is going to contrast in the flesh with in the spirit. And we will talk about that in the coming weeks. Just giving you a heads up now. Okay? In the flesh versus in the spirit. So Paul says, when we were in the flesh, something was happening. This is utterly fascinating. Something was happening. The law was arousing sinful passions within us. And those sinful passions caused us or worked in us to produce bad fruit. And we saw last week in here, that bad fruit was death. That's what the factory of our lives was cranking out. So our sinful passions were there before the law. But when the law comes, does it help us get rid of those passions? No. What is the weird word that Paul uses to describe what the law, how the law interacted with our sin and our sinful passions? The law aroused our sinful passions. It's a very interesting word. Now, this is not a perfect illustration, but, but just hang with me for a sec. The law is like the hunter, not, not me, but someone who's hunting. And, and, and it, the, the hunter comes across a sleeping beast that appears dead, and then the hunter starts poking at it. And what happens? The hunter of the law arouses the monster of sin. Bad idea. Bad idea. Now, let's move away from that illustration. It, it, well, not quite. It's been there. The monster's been there. But now it's angry or defiant or playful or hungry, and none of that is good. The only good state of sin within us is dead, mortified, put to death. That's the only good state of sin. And the law did everything but kill our sin. It displayed the beast of sin. It showcased it. It said, well, would you look at here? What's inside, Hunter? That wonderful, kind guardian and schoolmaster treated us so well. Said, oh, look, you're wrong in this area, in this area, in this area, in this area, in this. Oh, look, I can even do it without looking. All these areas. Like, look at all this sin in your life, Hunter. That's what the law did. It aroused sin. Well, I didn't know I wanted that until the law came and said, don't do it. It aroused the beast. And I said, well, by golly, now I want it. And Paul's going to move into this, and he's going to expound on this in, in, in the next week, in the verses ahead. Because then our question is, well, is the law sinful then, if it, if it did that? No. That's the question we're going to answer next week. And so the law showcased our sin. It, it showcased it so that we could say, oh, this isn't good. And I can't do anything about it. I'm in trouble and I need a rescue. I need to be rescued. Enter our Savior, our Rescuer, Jesus. As He enters our life, 
when we cry out for salvation, when we believe, the law hands us over to Jesus and Jesus says, thanks, I'll take it from here. They belong to me now, law. And the law steps aside and says, all right. The chalkboard of all of our sin is erased in Christ. Just like that. And so we're sitting here in our school seat, whatever those seats that are connected to the tables. And it's not, as e- it's not that easy to like get out of those. You know what I mean? So here, we're drowning in our sin, looking at the beast of it, and then God comes and sets us free, erases the chalkboard, and we're like, well, well how do I live? What do I do now? We are free from sin. We are free from the law. We are rescued. So here's what we do now. Verse 6. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the old letter of the law. If we again return to the marriage analogy, we could say the law kept us married to sin. We were bound to our sin by the law in some sense. Sin is what held us. Sin is what we were bound to, like the slave master analogy. Remember, we, it was our master. We were slaves of sin. And the law bound us to our sin. How can I escape sin if the law says don't covet and I then covet? Coveting being defined as denying contentment and yearning for what God has not given me, something that belongs to someone else. How can I escape sin if the law says honor your parents and then I dishonor them? I can't escape. I'm bound to my sin. I'm guilty. Christ comes and takes us to the cross with him, to the grave with him, and praise God to new life with him. This is the picture of baptism, which he says in the beginning of chapter 6. You've, you've, you've been baptized with Christ through death. And that's why we celebrate when someone is baptized, because they are displaying this spiritual reality that has taken place in them. That's a beautiful, amazing thing. Salvation. And in verse 6, we see again the answer to the question, why? Why have we died to what held us? So we could be free to sin and do whatever our flesh wants? Absolutely not. Thank you. Was that Kim? Thank you, Kim. Five stars or one gold star for now. (laughs) God forbid, by no means, we've been set free so we can serve. If we don't serve under the law, what do we serve under? We actually serve in get that not under in the newness of the spirit capital s we don't serve under the old letter of the law what in the world does this mean well spirit here is a reference to the holy spirit but it's also a contrast with letter the spirit versus the letter of the law we are led by the spirit of god now rather than by the letter of the law i believe we see examples of this when the disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are all like, hey, 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 Jesus, rebuke your disciples. They're disobeying the Lord. They're working on the Sabbath. They're working on the Sabbath. They're disobeying the law. And does Jesus say, oh, man, Pharisees, you're right. Hey, guys, stop. Go to the temple. Kill some goats. Does he correct the Pharisees' interpretation of the law? Well, kind of, but not really. He doesn't rebuke his disciples for disobeying his own commandment. And then he gives an illustration of David, and he says, hey, don't you remember when David disobeyed the law? I mean, this, what? How confusing would this have been to the Pharisees? You're claiming to be the Messiah? And you're okay with them breaking the law? What in the world is going on? It's not about the letter of the law, but that's all the Pharisees focused on. It's about the spirit, the heart behind it. And that doesn't mean, well, well, if it's not the letter of the law, I can go murder someone in good spirit. <laughs> no, absolutely not. So if that's where you want to take that, we have, other con- we have another conversation to have. That's not what we do with it. We don't dismiss our sin by saying, well, it's about the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law, so, you know, it's okay to do this or that. It's okay. 
No, but it's not okay because you broke the law. It's not okay because that's not pleasing to God and it's not who you are anymore. You're free. That's why it's not okay. Why are you going back to the old master and trying to justify it and trying to rationalize it? Repent. You're free in Christ. Please, Christ, serve in the newness of the Spirit. Serve Christ now. How do I follow the exact letter of the law is not the question we ask. But rather, where is the Spirit leading? What is God doing? What pleases the Lord? And thank God that the answer to these questions are not left to our whims and understanding. Well, let's all go guess this week what pleases the Lord. Let's try to figure out His will on our own. Oh, my soul. I'm sorry, everyone. Okay, look. The conclusion's right there, and I'm right here. We're almost there. You with me? You asleep? Okay, praise God. You guys have, are merciful and patient. Okay. What, this is why we have the Word of God. Because the Word helps us discern what is good and right and pleasing to the Lord. And that's even why we don't throw the law away. Not as something that we hold over our heads, but as a friend now. That we come alongside and we say, man, what, is the, what did the law say about this? That, that reveals God's desire that, that when it says, don't covet, what's behind that? What's going on? And why is that still not a good thing to do? Why is, because what it means is I'm not living in Christ, I'm not living as if I'm in Christ because I'm not trusting Him. I'm wanting something that He's not giving me, something He hasn't given me. So I don't want to covet now, not just because it says don't covet, but because coveting is a demonstration of not trusting God, of longing and reaching for something outside of Christ. Do you see the difference now? Look how we engage the law. It's a beautiful relationship. It's beautiful freedom. The first six verses of Romans. Our service is, no law, is not even limited to our desire and ability either but rather our submission to the Spirit of God. As we serve in submission, we serve the Spirit, we serve each other through the Spirit, we are carried along in the Spirit of God to accomplish the will of God. That's the Christian life. Where God leads, I follow. So when he says, hey, Hunter, you're getting off here, you shouldn't have spoke like that, that's not who you are, that's not the, that's not the newness of life I've given you, that's not in accordance with my desire, then I submit to the Spirit, I repent, I make amends if I need to, because I'm free to. I'm free in Christ. I'm forgiven in Christ. I do all that. Remember, I'm standing on the law in Christ. I'm already free. I'm already victorious. And so if I mess up, I don't get right because ah, God's going to, you know, the earth's going to open and I'm just going to, the sons of Korah, we're, we're just going to die. That's an awesome story in the Old Testament, under the law. It was rough. It was rough. The book of Numbers, is, you got serpents biting everybody. You got these diseases, and, and they're not getting any better. They're not like more righteous people. There's just less people because a lot of them die. <laughs> That's under the law. That's under the law, and that is not our Christian life. We are free to follow the Spirit because the Spirit ain't going to lead us to sin. The Spirit is not going to lead you into sin. The Spirit is not going to lead you to displease Christ. Now, I'm guessing we have, probably have a lot of questions after our study today, especially after reading Romans 7. I still have questions myself. And if anyone wants to talk, I'll see how many questions I can answer. If, if there are some and you know, some of you might ask questions that really challenge me to study and dig a little bit more for better answers. We're also not done with this study, okay? Next week, we're going to take a deeper look at how sin and the law function together and what that means for us. The conversation is not over. But as we conclude today, let me ask you, are you living as though you are still under the law? Or are you serving God in the newness of His Spirit? empowered by the Holy Spirit with joy in pursuing to know, love, and obey God. Because you must remember last week, we are slaves of righteousness. 
We want to obey. This is the master we belong to. Honestly, if I'm asking myself these questions, I think I might still be operating as if I'm under the law in a lot of these areas. I struggle with this. More than that, I don't, I don't think I totally get this. I can teach on it and agree that it is right, but when it comes to actually operating in freedom as I live, I find myself operating as if I'm under, still under the law, as if my performance is what makes me good and worthy. It's like when we hear Paul, you know, tell us, do this, don't do this, do this. It's like, oh, good, new laws. No, that's not how we take that. That's not how we hear that, but that's, that's still how I hear that. I'm in process, guys. So often my performance is the bar by which I measure myself. Well, I failed here. I failed to do that. That was a stupid move. What were you thinking there, Hunter? What fruit are you bearing, Hunter? And on and on and on. This is the chatter in my head. So maybe you're like me today. You believe you are saved. You believe you are in Christ. But you're not sure how to stop living under the law. And if that's you... We are going to be okay. We're going to be okay. God is working in us. He's going to help us. That is our hope. This is a process. Just because slaves are free doesn't mean they know how to operate or live in that freedom right away. And just because they don't know how to be free doesn't mean that they aren't actually free. Just because you don't know how to live in your freedom yet doesn't mean you must still be enslaved. No, you're learning. Isn't God patient? Isn't God merciful? Isn't God loving? We are free in Christ, even if we don't totally know how to walk in it. And He is teaching us. He is not in a hurry. He is not in a hurry, which is just hard to believe. Some of you need to kind of bang that truth into your head. God is not in a hurry. God is not in a hurry. I need that truth. He's not demanding you get this immediately. He's patient. He's good. Hang in there. Stay along for the journey. Pray. Father, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for the patience of your people. Oh, thank you, God, that you're strong in my inadequacies and my monologues and me losing my place. It's just you're good. Lord, we worship Christ. We worship you today. It's all up to you. It's all from you anyway. So Lord, thank you that you're going to help this people discern what is of the Spirit and maybe what was of my flesh and maybe what was not helpful or not maybe, you know, as scripturally accurate as it should have been. It could have been phrased a different way. All that stuff, Lord. Lord, take these questions. May we bring them to you with hearts of faith, believing that you will hear, believing that you would answer. And Lord, this last song we sing, Oh, Father, would you use it? Would you use it to help us rejoice? Help us rejoice in you. Thank you for the work you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.